Nat, thank you so much for joining us and your willingness to be our first person today. You have so much to share with us in a very short hour, so we'll jump right into it if that's okay that's with fine. you. That's fine, okay. Now, you were, you were not yet three when Germany invaded Poland in September 1939, starting World War II. But before we turn to World War II and the Holocaust, start first with telling us a little bit about your family, your community, and their life in, in your little town. Uh, both my parents were born in the eastern part of Hungary. My mother was the oldest of 12 children, and my father was the youngest of seven. Uh, in 1924, about a year after World War I ended, uh, my father and two of his older brothers decided to move to Romania, where they established a large dairy farm, and one of their largest customers was the Romanian army. They lived there for a while. Both of my father's brothers were already married, and children starting to come, and then he decided it's time for him to get married as well. Mm -hmm. So the most logical place to find a bride in those days was one should go back to a village one came from. So in 1932, my father decided to go back to Hungary to find a bride, and at that time, he contacted a matchmaker. Uh, Match.com did not exist at that point <laughs> yet, so he uh, contacted a matchmaker, and uh, he told the matchmaker he's looking for a bride, and she asked him, what do you look and what kind of a person you look for? So he said, look for a pretty girl, somebody who can cook, somebody who can take care of the children and educate them. Today, that kind of requirement wouldn't go too far. But nonetheless, there was a requirement at that point. And she said to him, yeah, I think I have the right person for you, the right girl. They met in her parents or her, her father's home for about an hour, uh, including the father and matchmaker. And then finally, uh, about two days later, he said to the matchmaker, I'd like to see that girl again. And uh, they were made a date somehow, and then he said, can I actually go with that girl out for a walk instead of sitting in front of her father? She said, sure. They went for a walk, and not far behind was the matchmaker as a chaperone. So nonetheless, uh, they had a good time. Different today. Different days, <laughs> right. So before long, uh, he decided that probably is the right person for him, and about a week later, they were married. Wow. And after they were married, uh, my father brought his new bride to Romania, and before long, three children were born, two boys, two girls and a boy, and I'm that boy. And you're spaced with you in the middle, two years apart. Two years right? apart, that's correct. Nat, you, um, you shared with me that you had three different birth dates. Can, can you give us uh, uh, insight into that? Yeah, we lived, as I say, on the farm, and uh, every time that a child was born, he did not go in to register that child in the big city. So I was actually born December 26, 1936, but somehow, uh, by the time my father got to the official office to record my, my birth date, must have been three days later. So it was December 29, 1936. And somehow, another uh, thing happened that my recorded birthday was recorded as December 28, 1938. So I got three different birthdays. Three different birthdays. Right. You, and, you shared with me that, you, that there wasn't, at least as far as you know, there wasn't a lot of anti-Semitism in your community at that time. Can you say a little more about that? Yeah, there was a small community. The total Jewish community on, in that uh, area uh, was approximately three to one. I was about 25% Jewish and 75% non-Jewish. Um, we lived in peace and harmony with all these people. Uh, my father traded with some of the Gentile farmers. Uh, my father helped out many of these Gentile farmers when there were uh, problems with droughts and things like that. So there was no anti-Semitism in that particular community. We did not feel any different. Uh, I did not, when I started going to kindergarten and to first grade, I did not feel any different. Although World War II began when Germany and Russia attacked Poland in September 1939, it wasn't until 1941 that the lives of your family and other Jews in your community near the city of Yash changed dramatically. What can you tell us about that period after the start of the war and before the, the summer and fall of 1942, those first couple of years of the war? What was it like for you? Uh, I had a great childhood. It was a, lived in a farm, did some chores for the, for the house. Um, 
There was a primitive life. We did not have any running water or electricity, but it was a good life. Uh, I went to kindergarten, I went to first grade, things were okay. Mm -hmm. One of our neighbors was a priest <clears throat> who used to come by once a week and ask my father for a donation to the church and also some dairy products for some of his uh, individuals who could not otherwise afford it. In almost 18 years that my father lived in that community, never once had he, had he uh, denied such a request. So every time the priest used to come over, uh, my mother was to send us children out to go greet the priest and ask him about his health, ask him how his family is, and we used to do that on a weekly basis. One day in November 1942, the same priest showed up, but this time he showed up with a police officer and two Iron Guard soldiers. He, that never happened before, so we all went out to greet him and find out why he came with the police officer mm -hmm. this time. So we came close to the, to the priest, and as we came close to him, he is looking at the police officer and pointing at us and said to them, STG dons, these are Jews. So we were turned over to the authorities by a priest. Who you had known and associated with for 18 years yeah. prior to that. Right. Be before you go on about that, let me ask you another question. I believe in, the, in 1941, there was a terrible pogrom against the Jews in Yash in 1941. What can you tell us about that? In, in July of 1930, 1941, um, about 10,000 Jews were murdered by pretty much like neighbors and strictly for monetary gain. Uh, and I was, was authorized by the government. They, they did not, were not punished. There was also another uh, problem where three trainloads of Jewish people were loaded in Yash and they were sent to Kalarashi, which was a town on the, on the south of Romania for three days without food or water. So when they came back to Yash after three days, I would say most of the people were not alive. Mm. Uh, so a lot of people were, were murdered by, by the Iron Guard and, and by fascists and collaborators of the Nazi regime. The, the Iron Guard, that was the fascist uh, party in, in Romania at that time? That's correct. Yeah, okay. yeah. You, as you started to tell us that on this one day in, in the fall of 1942, the priest came with the authorities, pointed you out as Jews. Tell us what happened from there. Uh, the police officer uh, stepped forward and he said, uh, you have four hours to vacate the farm because he has orders to relocate us into another part of the big city of Yash. My father tried speaking to him and said, look, I've known you since you were a little boy. I've known your family for so many years. My, father, my mother tried to reason with him. Uh, she said, I, this is our home. Our children were born here. Can't you just forget about this order? He said, these are my orders and that's, I'm just carrying them out. But he said, but we're gonna let you take one horse in a wagon and load whatever valuables you wanna take with you. Now at that point, we pretty much knew where we were going because in 1941, there was a ghetto established in the city of Yash, so we pretty much knew where we were going. Uh, after the four hours were over, uh, the police- So you literally had four hours four to hours, do that. Yeah. You, you told me that when, when that happened, it was like your words, like a bolt out of the blue, that, that you were stunned, do you remember what that was like? Uh, well, the first thing that really hit us hard, number one, I saw my, my mother crying because yeah. she, did, she knew pretty much what's gonna happen to us. And the second thing that really jolted me is what, when, once we arrived in the ghetto, when we were giving one room for the five of us in a house that already housed four other families. Mm -hmm. uh, coming from, out from a big house, uh, coming into one, one room without anything in that room, the only thing we had is two beds, there was no closets, no table, no chairs. We had to store our valuables underneath the beds kind of to keep there, mm -hmm. so. And this was the Sokola a ghetto that right. you had been moved yeah. into. Well, what was life like in the Sokola? Well, once we arrived to, to that area, we were turned over to the, to the ghetto authorities, mm -hmm. where we were told what we can do and what we cannot do. Most of the things is we cannot do. Uh, we were given the rules how to behave while we were there, while we were their guests in a way. We didn't ask to be their guests, but nonetheless, right, we were right, their guests. Right. Um, and then everybody had to do manual work. Everybody had to work. It didn't matter if the individual was a doctor, an engineer, uh, anything, but had to do manual work. My father's job was to 
sweep the streets during the summertime and shovel snow during the wintertime. And also on a Thursday, which was the farmer's market, which for Yash, he'll clean the market area. So that's pretty much was on a daily basis. And for that, we did not get paid. And what, what in return though, we received rations. The ration was primarily for bread and some kerosene that would help us to warm the room and, and cook a little bit. The rations was about a quarter of a loaf of bread per person every two days. A quarter loaf. Yeah. And to receive these rations, we had to come out and leave the ghetto. We could not leave the ghetto before 5 a.m. And also, while we were in the ghetto, we had to wear a yellow star with the word Jidan or Jew on it, so we could be easily identified to the non-Jewish people. You, um, you, you, I think you referred to the Sokola ghetto as an open ghetto. What, what did that mean, an open ghetto? Uh, we know that there were many, many ghettos established in Eastern Europe. Some of them were closed ghettos and some of them open ghettos. The closed ghettos were like the Warsaw Ghetto was enclosed by a wall or barbed wire. The, our ghetto was open ghetto where we could roam freely in a certain area. For instance, on the east side of the ghetto was a river, on the west side was the railroad track, the north side was a big textile factory, the south side was a big church of the thing. So within that perimeter, we were allowed to work. Mm -hmm. Anybody caught outside that perimeter would be severely punished. Mm -hmm. And you would remain there for, you, actually I think you remained in Sokola until night, the spring of 1945. Tell us about that period between when you first went there and when Yash was liberated by the Soviets in the summer of 1944, a two year, almost a two and a half to three year period you were there. How, how did your family manage to, to survive and make ends meet with such restrictive rationing going on and the other restrictions you were under? What, what, were, what was it like for your family to, to maintain a family? Well, the first, is to get the rations, as I mentioned, we had to leave the ghetto and get, line up at the bakery and get our rations. Uh, since my sister, one sister, was older than me, so my father would send her out to get the rations until we found out that some hooligans are picking on Jewish girls. So he was afraid of my sister and he started sending me out. Uh, now, the same hooligans would pick on Jewish boys as well. Many times I would come home beaten up uh, but that did not hurt as much as when these hooligans also took away my bread, which meant for the next two days mm. we had nothing to eat. When my mother realized what happened for the first time, she also realized that this could happen again. And what she did from that point on, she started rationing us from our own rations. So we received bread today, she removed one slice. Two days later, we had two slices. Four days later, three slices, until she accumulated an entire loaf of bread. And by that, these hooligans took away my bread, and it happened before, so at least we had something to eat. Mm -hmm. To get our rations for kerosene, we had to line up to get the things sometimes immediately after 5 a.m. and wait in line until the attendant would show up sometimes uh, between 7 and 7.30, uh, and then give us the and kerosene. And this was for cooking purposes for and cooking heating. cooking and heating, heating yeah. 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 Uh, yes, I want you to tell us more about about getting the, you going out to get the kerosene ration. Before that, I'd like to mention one thing. Okay. When my father was uh, actually cleaning the, um, the market area, an old farmer that my father helped in the past came over to him and he said to him, uh, Domino Spitzer, I'm so sorry to see you, the condition you are. We knew you were a wealthy person. You helped us out a lot. You were a good person. Here you are cleaning after my oxen and my, my horses. It breaks my heart, he said. Is there anything I can do for you? So my father said, well, some extra food would always help. So he told my father that he's gonna go back uh, and talk to other farmers to see if they can help us somewhere. When he came back the next Thursday, when it was the farm, farmer's market day, the old farmer came over to him and said, we agreed to help you out, and here's how we're gonna do that. He said, the older farmers get together on a field on Wednesday night. By midnight, they all get together and go towards the farmer's market. And that caravan passes the outskirts of the ghetto between two and three o'clock in the morning. And he said to my father, why don't you watch out for the last three wagons of that caravan and we'll throw something your way. And he told them where to wait for him. Mm -hmm. And my father did that. 
that next Thursday between two and three o'clock in the morning he went out. He didn't tell my mother what he was planning to do because my mother would have told him not to do that because right. it's dangerous. Because anybody caught between two and three o'clock in the morning outside the ghetto only meant one thing, that a guy tries to escape and that would be punishable by prison or worse. Or worse. Yeah. Uh, so he did and then he came back from the first time and he found in the package these farmers threw his way. Uh, we found some cheese and we found some, some cornbread and things mm -hmm. like that. So every Thursday, uh, my, mother, my father would go out and try to find, get something from these farmers. And uh, even one time, I remember we found uh, in, in many times different things, eggs and, and cheeses and so on. But one time, uh, just before Christmas, we found a cured ham. Mm. And we couldn't eat it because we kept kosher. So we traded that on the black market for other things. Mm -hmm. uh, most uh, ghettos uh, did have a black, big black market. Uh, people took advantage of being able to go out of the ghetto risk their lives in a way, come back with products that were needed in the ghetto and sell it for very high inflatable prices. So. Were these same farmers, were they, were they um, the ones who helped your father to get cattle? Yeah, that's a, one in particular one, one later in particular. on. Yeah. Tell, tell us about the cattle. Well, this was after the war. Oh, it was, this was, it was not until after, after the war. Yeah, okay, yeah, we'll yeah. come back to that yeah. later. During that time, what, what about your education? Were you able to to attend school? No, we were no longer allowed to go to school. Uh, religion, practicing religion was against the law. Uh, but my mother very uh, highly believed in education. So in that ghetto, we had a rabbi and his wife, elderly individual, that he taught us uh, different uh, uh, religious subjects, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and his wife taught us secular subjects. Now, meeting with this rabbi or meeting, having the rabbi meeting with us was also against the law. So there were a few children that got together that this rabbi would, would teach. We were always going to different houses so the police would not know that there, there's a school in a, certain, in a certain room. So all that's so, very clandestine. Very clandestine, very yeah. clandestine. Um, you, you There were two sections of the ghetto, if I remember correctly. You're, you had uncles and their families that were living in another section, right. but you weren't allowed to cross over uh, through sort of the, the, the non-ghetto area to go visit them. Correct. That was the two brothers that my father had the, the farm with yeah. and had their families. Uh, so obviously we did not see them during that period of yeah. time. How, do you, how did you know how they were doing? Did you have uh, any we way? Did not. You, we did did not, not, no. you did they not. They did not know our fate. We did not know their fate. Right. right. Yeah. Let's turn back to um, your going to get the kerosene, the ration of kerosene for the family. And Gregor, I want, I want you to tell us about that. Uh, well, when I realized my father uh, risked his life to go out for us to bring back food from these farmers, I always tried to figure out what can I do to help the family survive longer. So every week that I came up to the kerosene station, one day I decided to ask the attendant. Uh, his name was Grigori. Grigori. And I called him Domino Grigori. Now, Domino is reserved for a very... That's the title domino for a very intellectual person, uh, some very educated, uh, a lot of power. So I said to him, Domino Grigori, I'd like to help you out. So he's looking at me and he said to me, and I was not a tall kid, so he said, you little Jidan, you want to help me? I said, yeah. Now the best thing to, to, uh, to, to tell, to give you a picture of Grigori was, he was uneducated, lazy, and a drunk. So that's the, the best thing you can, you can tell right. about him. So he's looking at me, he says, you want to help me? And I said, yes. And he said, how are you going to do that? I said, well, you look, you're sick. Probably he had a hangover or something. Yeah. Why don't you let me do your job for you? And if that pleases you, I would appreciate if you give me a little bit extra kerosene because my little sister, she's sick, and we could use a little extra kerosene to warm up the room. He didn't say anything, and then the next week, uh, we all lined up around f after 5.15 in the morning, we lined up to get the kerosene. He shows up, but instead of going into his booth and warm up, he walked the line where everybody was lining up. And when he made eye contact with me, he showed me to come forward. So I did. <clears throat> so I said, okay, little Shidan, let me see what you can do. And it was not a big deal. And you're, you're seven years old. I seven think, and a half yeah. almost, seven yeah. And a half. yeah. So it was not a big deal to, to pump a little kerosene. And I did that job for him, and that's it. He didn't say anything. He said, next week, you don't have to wait in line. Just come to the station itself and wait for me here, which I did. 
and pumped the kerosene for the entire line, for the entire day, didn't give me anything in return. Then I realized what a dummy I must have been, just do the work and not get anything in return. But on the fourth week, he said to me, little Shidan, bring an extra can with you next time. So from that point on, he always gave me an extra liter, liter and a half, and depends how drunk he was. Sometimes he'd give me two liters or twice. Two liters, yeah. He didn't, he didn't. He forgot he already gave me once. And, so. and if it was more than you needed, then, then it became something you could barter. Exactly, and that's exactly what, yeah. what I did. We, yeah. we bartered for that. Also, we bartered a lot of things that we got from the farmers. Mm -hmm. when, when we had too many potatoes, we'll, we'll trade that for mm -hmm. something else, mm -hmm. for, for flour or for things like that we, we could use. Uh, so we bartered kerosene. And also, whenever we had extra things, my mother always used to send me to the rabbi, take this to the rabbi as well. So we always had something for them to, to take. Uh, and that went on for a while. <clears throat> I think you, um, if, I remember you shared with me that um, you, you somehow managed to get a little plum brandy to take to Gregor. Well, when my father later on was sent away to a uh, uh, slave labor camp in, in uh, 1944, uh, I tried to get a shirt for myself to wear look underneath the bed because that's pretty much what our clothing were kept. Mm -hmm. And I found a little bottle of Schlibowitz. Schlibowitz, for those who don't know, it's a plum, plum brandy. And I didn't, again, didn't tell my mother what I was planning to do with that. And <clears throat> I took that plum brandy to Domino Grigori. And when I showed him what I had, his eyes lit up. He, because it must have been good brandy. Mm -hmm. uh, so I said, so he said to me, I guess you want some extra kerosene for that. And I say, no, what I would like to have is an extra ration card for a family of four. He didn't say anything, but three weeks later, he showed up with a ration card for a family of four, which meant I had another loaf of bread every two days, right. mm -hmm. another five liters of kerosene once a week, so definitely had something to trade. Mm -hmm. And every time we had something to trade, my father and I would go together, because if a grown-up would be caught with things like that, you know, what we call contraband. Extra anything. Anything, right. right. That was not part of the, the ghetto thing. Right. So the man would have been punished very severely. A child would be slapped around a couple of times and let go. Yeah. So my father always used to tell me that, or to tell people, I took Nat along for my protection. So I protected my father. Mm -hmm. So we were trading many things on the, on the black mm -hmm. market. So that's what we have, some kerosene, some bread, always being able to trade. And I think at that point, I must have been eight years old, the youngest, Black marketeer, yeah, and and, and yeah. building future business future, skills. Probably, right. Nat, um, you um, mentioned your your father was was taken for forced labor in early 1944. What do you know about that? What was he forced to do, and and what did it mean to the rest of the family once he was taken? At the beginning of 1944, a big sign was posted in the ghetto, stating that <clears throat> every individual between the ages of 18 and 50 must assemble two days later at a certain spot in the ghetto, and they will be no longer working in the area itself, but they will be shipped someplace else. Uh, so that night, he pretty much knew where he was going because about six or seven months earlier than that, another group of people was sent away. And he was sent away to lay railroad tracks in the eastern part of Romania. Also, the night before he left, obviously none of us were able to sleep, all crying, we didn't know when we were going to see our father again, if we were ever going to see him. Mm -hmm. uh, so that morning, uh, I was just about ready to leave the room. I said to him, do you mind if I walk with you to the assembly area? And he said, sure. And I, I did that, and we walked hand in hand to the area. And finally, when we got to the point, he said to me, Nat, it's time for you to go back. And at that time, he, put, he turned around to me, and he put his hand on my shoulder, and he said five words to me that would stay with me for the rest of my life. He said, Nat, take care of the girls. So I'm eight years old at this point. Right. You can't imagine the, the hardship and the pressure that puts on a, on a young child. I could have said, I'll try my best or I'll do whatever I can. But instead, I said, I will, Papa, I will. I will. So that kind of, many times I was, ready, I was ready to give up. But I always remembered that I promised my father that I will take care of the girls. Mm -hmm. And at that point, I just couldn't, I figured if I don't survive, neither will they. Right. Once he was gone, did you have any idea where he was? Were you able to communicate with him? Was he able to send any kind of word to your mom as to how he was doing? 
No, we didn't, couldn't hear, we didn't, no Nothing. communication no whatsoever. Communication. Uh, I remember falling asleep, my mother crying every night, uh, praying for his fast or quick return, uh, for his safe return, for his health and so on. So, you know, going back, going to sleep every night with the cries, my mother kind of leaves terrible impression on you as, you know, you know, you realize how, what hardship is. Right, uh, right. So we did not hear from him yeah. for, until the, the war was over. And, and, and speaking of the war being over, the Russian front was moving in and in the summer of 1944, the Russians liberated Yash and you were there at that time. Tell us what you can about the Russian attack on Yash uh, and what what life was like for you and your family once they had taken Yash, and yet the war is obviously going to continue for almost another year from that point, so elsewhere. So what was that like at that time? In the time, that in the, in the uh, summer of 1944, towards the end, there was, the city of Yash was bombed on e almost every night. And then one time, it would start bombing at night and continue the next day and the next day for three days. And then we didn't know what happened at this point. So all of us, whoever had rooms in, in, in a particular house, was bombed and they, they, the Russians or the Allies were going after the houses. So we all ran out to the fields. We had what they called tranches or trenches that we hide in these trenches. Basically a hole in the a ground. A hole in the ground covered with ground. some leaves or, or branches. So there was nothing, but it was an open field. So we thought that the Allies would not bomb open fields, and that's the only reason that we ran to the field to Because they're, they're targeting the houses. Yeah. So as long as they're pinpoint accuracy, you're okay. Correct. Right. So we were in the, then for about three days, there was bombing. And then after three days, all of a sudden, it was quiet. And we didn't know what happened. Then one elderly person who was with us in the trench, he's, he looks out and he said, we are liberated, the war is over. And we couldn't understand what he meant by that. And he said to us, look out. And we looked out on the field. We saw individuals dressed with gray long coats, uh, gray fur hats with a red star on their forehead. And he said, these are Russians. So we were liberated by the Russians at the time. Did you realize that you were safe at that point? We didn't know exactly what happened, but we knew that the war is over, we were liberated. And there were, there were kind of people smiling already, but until later on, once we, we, we were able to really be liberated, uh, we were able to go back to school, but still there was a lot of anti-Semitism even by the Russians. Yeah. Uh, we were ridiculed in, in class because we lost about two and a half years of our education. So many times you find a 10-year-old boy in second grade. So the, the Gentile kids always ridiculed us saying, these Jewish kids must be dumb because they're 10 years old and they're in second grade. In second so grade, yeah. we caught up later on, but nonetheless, in the beginning, it was pretty hard mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. um, and then under the communist regime, uh, anybody that did well in school what became what they called a pioneer. And the pioneers were um, communist um, society for children. And we received a red tie with a little pin and uh, I was a pretty good student, and so was my younger sister, but we never asked to join the pioneers because Jews were not allowed to do not so. Allowed. So we did experience a lot of anti-Semitism under the, under the Russians. During, during that time, after liberation in, in August of 1944, the war is formally over in May of 1945. Your father was still gone for most of that time. How did? How did your mother manage with you and your sisters to sort of try to get a sense of normalcy back and feed themselves and, and to make ends meet? What was that like? A normalcy, I wouldn't call it norm normal because it was, nothing was normal at the time. Uh, my mother became a nurse in, in the hospital, so she did that. Uh, we were able to get free food from the Russians, so we did not need that kind of money to buy food, although we were able to go out and buy in a regular store where prior to that we were not allowed to do so. Uh, so little by little, we, would, we called it the, the survival mode. We went into like every day the same thing, and we were just hoping for the best yeah. until we find out little by little people starting to come back into the ghetto, those who were shipped out. And every time a new person came back, I always would run over to them, have you seen my father? Right. And then we tried for many, many times, and finally one individual came back sometimes late uh, in 45, in the spring of 45, and said, yeah, I saw your father about a month ago. 
So we thought if he saw him a month ago, chances are probably he would still be alive. But we haven't heard from him for all that period of time. Tell us about his return. Well, when the war was over, he tried to come back to where we were. He hitchhiked on, on many uh, Russian convoys. He walked a lot, hitchhiked on wagons with the former, far, farmers. And finally, he showed up. And obviously, we all were very happy to see him. And we were there for, he was there for about a week or so. And he told me, Nat, it's time for us to go back to the farm and get everything mm -hmm. organized mm -hmm. to bring the family back. Uh, so we did that, and, but he said, before we go back to the farm, let's go visit that old farmer who helped us all these months mm -hmm. and just thank him officially. So we went to the farmer, he was very happy to see us, that, number one, that we survived. He invited us to a meal, and after we finished the meal, he asked us, where are you going from here? And my father said, of course, we're going home, we're going to the farm. He said, I wouldn't do that because that farm no longer belongs to you. That farm was divided into three sections. The priest and his family received one section. The same priest. The same priest. The police officer received another section, and the one who actually gave the order for us to be deported was the mayor of that little town. So the three, so my father took his advice and not go back to that farm. Do you know if they were allowed to, under the communists, keep the farm? At that farm? point, we didn't know you what didn't happened. Know, right. What happened, uh, although, but. We knew exactly at that time we shouldn't go back because our lives was in danger. Right, right. And my, fa my father took his advice and didn't go back. With, with the, your father back and uh, the war over, when, when did the full magnitude of the Holocaust and its impact on your extended family, when did you realize what its full impact was? Or about, when did your parents realize yeah. it? About two years after the war was over, my father realized that there's no longer a future for Jewish people in Romania. So we tried to leave the country, and every time we applied for a visa to leave, and the only place one could go at that time was Palestine, the only country that would accept Jewish people. So every time we filed that petition to leave the country, it came back denied. Mm -hmm. uh, and finally, uh, Later on, so many times we filed the petition, came back denied. Uh, my mother took the three of us children to the individual who was responsible to give out these visas to leave. Uh, and he said to him, these are my children. She, whatever money she had, she put on his desk. All her jewelry she had, she put on front of him. and said, that's all we have. Please let us leave. And finally, he must have gotten pity on her. And he said, come back a week later, and we received and we received our, our papers to leave. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, though, we never heard from all our family back in Hungary, which was my grandparents, my uncles, my aunts, my cousins. Uh, and we know from history that uh, Germany was invaded by the Nazis in March of 1944. Hungary was invaded, Hungary, I mean, yeah. yeah. So, and, and, the, and they immediately started deporting people to Auschwitz. Between April 15, 1944 and July 9, 1944, 440,000 Jews were deported to Auschwitz. Among these 440,000 were 33 members of my family, my grandparents, my uncles, my aunts. Uh, immediately, once they arrived in Auschwitz, the young, very young ones and very old ones were immediately put to death. Mm -hmm. the, the rest were in, in the, 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 Auschwitz had two camps. They were sent to a war camp. Some of them were shipped to other camps. Uh, well, most of them died, we don't know where, when, or how. We only know the fate of three individuals, my grandfather and two of his sons, or two of my uncles. Of all, all the 30 of that all are deported, 30, that's yeah. all you know. Uh, and then we find out that my grandfather died of starvation a month before he was liberated. Two of my uncles survived the liberation. One was 21 years old, one was 22 years old. Mm -hmm. They each one weighed 65 pounds. So you can imagine what they look like. And when you say to somebody, you look like skin and bones or, or walking skeletons, that's pretty much what they were. And when the Red Cross came in to these camps and saw the condition these people were in, uh, they put them on ships and took them to Sweden, which Sweden was a neutral country at the time. Uh, unfortunately, one of these two brothers did not make it to Sweden. He was buried at sea, and one did survive and was in Sweden in a hospital in a, in a sanatorium for four years to gain his weight and health back. And he was the one? He was the only one survived only out one of 33 survived. individuals, yeah. So your, your family is doing everything it can to try to leave communist Romania. 
Um, and, and I think you shared with me that they really had to make bribes. They had to do all kinds of things to get you, finally get you out of Romania. Yeah, so eventually by 1950, we were able to receive an exit visa. Uh, after, like you said, bribes, and my mother gave them all whatever we had value to this individual. And around April of 1950, we arrived in Israel at the time, uh, although we applied when Israel was still Palestine before right. it was 1948. Uh, and I was in Israel for about 11 years until 1961. What do you remember of arriving in Israel? Well, the first thing, the freedom that we had, yeah. uh, seeing an orange for the first time, when, you know, it's just unbelievable. And the, you can do whatever you wanted. You didn't have to stay in line for things, you know, mm -hmm. just, although this still was a young country, uh, a lot of things were still not available, but nonetheless, you were free. When you went back to school. So that was, the freedom was enormous. What, what did your father do and, and the family do to sort of build a new life in Israel now that once you were there, what did, what did that involve? Uh, the, the thing that my father knew was farming and, and being, doing things with milk and dairy products, so he became a distributor for dairy products in Israel, and that pretty much lasted until he retired. And, and how about you? I think I, I, you, you shared with me that um, your father sent you out in search of some relatives that might be living in Israel. Tell us about that. Yeah, we arrived in Israel in the port of Haifa, and then about three days later, we were sent to an absorption center. Uh, and then about a week later, just before Passover time, about this time of the year, he said to me, uh, take two sisters and go find somebody, one of our, one of our relatives in a place called Natania. Uh, I did not speak the language. Uh, I spoke a little bit Yiddish. Uh, some, some Romanian, but that did not go far. But then we found out. In the and you're like 14 years old. Right. Now, yeah. And then, you know, 13. So, 13. I, you know, taken, taken, going on bus. And every time I used to come to front to the, to the driver, I said, is this Natanya? He says, no. Is this Natanya? No. Finally, the driver says, sit down. I'll tell you when we get there. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we finally got to Natanya. I did not have an address. I did not have anything. Only knew is, is Avram Cohen. That's all, and then we found him. And you found him, found and you him. found him. It, in 1955, you joined the Israeli army, you became a member of an elite paratrooper unit, and ended up fighting in the Suez Canal, or the Suez uh, war, Canal War in 1956. You were wounded. W will you tell us uh, about, about that happening to you, and then about your treatment afterwards. Yeah, uh, I was wounded while well, I was fighting uh, in, in Egypt and in, mm -hmm. in the Suez Canal in the, in the uh, uh, Sinai Desert. And I was wounded and after they patched me up, they sent me back uh, behind the lines, back into a hospital. And they sent me to a place called Tel Ashumer, uh, where my mother was a volunteer nurse at the time. So. Uh, we couldn't communicate, we did not have any cell phones at the time to communicate back home. So the first time when she saw me is when I was, came off with, on, a, on a stretcher. So well, that's when the first time. So, that's so when, when you went, you didn't know, didn't she, know was she was there. there. She didn't know that I was coming in. So that's the first uh, uh, things that we had a, a, com a little conversation that wow. she was happy that I'm alive. <laughs> and I was yes. happy to see her as well. So there was, there was a good reunion mm -hmm. at the time. And you would live in Israel for 11 years and right. then finally made another huge move to the United States. Tell us, tell us about coming here. What did that involve for you? Okay, when one day uh, that uh, my mother's brother, my uncle who survived, uh, finally... Uh, the one, the one the who one, the one that survived right? in Sweden. He managed to, to come and live in the United States. He was able to immigrate here. And one day in July, uh, he decided to come and visit his sister, visit us in, in Israel. And he told me stories about America, how great it was, and I kind of fell in love with all these stories. And I said, you know, I would like to come to America to see what it's all about. So he actually uh, sponsored me to come out, mm -hmm. and I came. I fell in love, like everybody, or every, every immigrant falls mm -hmm. in love with America, so I decided to stay here. And, uh, from that point on, everything was history. It, so, it, but it wasn't quite that simple, was it? You had to go through some hoops. Yeah, we had to, we had to get special permissions. Number one, permission from the Israeli army to be able to leave the country. Uh, coming into the United States, I came in on a specific visa, as a visitor visa. 
and then I could not convert that to a resident visa, so I had to leave the country and then come back on a different visa, which I did. And after that, I filed my regular papers and took a while to get my green card. I became a citizen. And, and have built this built incredible it. life here in the yeah. United States. Yeah. Nat, I'm going to ask you just one more question, and I think we have, we have some time. We can turn to our audience and see if they have questions of, of you, and if not, I'll ask you more. But um, tell us about your, your mother and father. Um, how was the rest of their lives, and, and when did they pass away? Uh, my father passed away around 17 years ago. Okay. He was 92. Uh, my mother passed away around 11 years ago. She was 90. Uh, their health at the end was not so well. Uh, my mother always suffered. My father had dementia in the last few years. Um, and my, father, my mother decided not to put him into an, an institution. She wanted to take care of him by herself. Mm -hmm. I guess that's the, the old fashion way of, of, of uh, helping your spouse and so on. So that helping my, f my, my father all these years pretty much aged her quite a bit. Uh, so I used to go there, my wife and I used to go they, there. They stayed in Israel. They stayed in Israel. Yeah. They stayed in a small town called Petah Tikva. Mm -hmm. And my, my wife and I visit her from, you know, a few times a year, bring in the grandchildren there. Mm -hmm. um, and then after he passed away, uh, the only thing we have, I have now is to, both of my sisters live in, in, living in, there. There in the same town. One other question for you, actually. You've not been back to Romania, have you? No. What's your thoughts about, um, there, there may be a reason for you to go back at some point you shared with me. Yeah, the reason I did not go back is there was not, there was not fun time for me at the mm -hmm. time. Very bad memories. Uh, I came one time close. I have my son Jeff, which you mentioned. Mm -hmm. He was a colonel and was involved with NATO. He was in Macedonia one time. He said, Dad, I'm not far from Romania. Why don't you meet me here? We'll rent a car and we'll drive to Romania and see where you were born. And um, I almost did it, but just the last minute I couldn't do that. Right. But there is a possibility still because I found out that I have a cousin, which is about my age, from my father's older brother, the youngest daughter, mm -hmm. that is still alive in, in Yash itself. It's very hard to communicate with them, uh, number one, with the language situation. Also, it, right now, the Jewish population is very small. Uh, it's a lot of poverty there. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the communication, I have some involvement with the museum, try to help me out to be able to find her. And once we found her and be able to, to talk to her, perhaps maybe I'll go out and visit so before. So it's, it's a possibility. It's a possibility yeah. before either she or I pass away. So at least okay. to see one more relative that's still alive. Yeah. Matt, you want to take some questions from our audience sure. for you? We, um, we would invite you to um, ask a question of Nat. Our only requests are one, use a microphone, and we have microphones in each aisle. Uh, we ask that you um, make your question as brief as you can, and I'll do my best to repeat it just to make sure we and all of you hear it, hear it correctly. So um, if anybody has a question they would like to ask Nat, please um, take advantage of this opportunity uh, to do that, uh, including um, Nat's family members if they wanted to do that as well. Um, but we'll, we'll, uh, we'll wait for a, bra a brave soul to go up there. And um, Nat, what, when you, um, before you joined the army uh, in Israel, what, what were your plans at that time for your future? What were you thinking that you would, you would do? Uh, originally, you know, like every Jewish mother wants their son to be a doctor, so I, uh, <laughs> I tried to go, I tried to, uh, so I went to school to, to study that, um, uh, dentistry in a way, but the first couple of years you learn dental lab, lab work. So actually that helped me out later on when I came to the United States, uh, because I said I'm a dental technician. So although I did not know much about dentistry, but, but you had a title. I had a title, right? Yep. And at yep. least I was able to make $45 a week yep. working for 40 hours, 40 hour a week. That's so. pretty easy to calculate the hourly rate on that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think we have a couple yeah. of questions over here, Nat. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, my name is Grant Jordan. I'm an amateur sociologist studying at North Carolina State University. Uh, speaking on your uh, life experiences and the education that you've obtained, do you foresee ever an, an event 
uh, that is similar to the Holocaust occurring in, in the next 50 to 100 years. The question is, can you see something like a Holocaust occurring in the next 50 years um, or even other parts of the world? Well, if you take a look at what's happening right yeah. now in the world, you realize Holocaust still happening. You know what happened in Cambodia in 1975, where 25% of the population was murdered because of religious reasons. Syria, uh, different parts of the world is, still have problems, which means it's our, our job is to make sure we expose these atrocities. And the museum is doing a great job exposing these type of things, and they be able to read the signs of what happens in these countries. So could it happen again? It's happening, unfortunately. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Here we go. Hi. Um, I was just wondering, what kind of an impact on you personally did the Holocaust have on your faith? What was the impact of the Holocaust on you and your faith? Uh, there was two, two ways people looked at it. One that lost their faith completely, and one that had their faith <laughs> being strengthened. Uh, in my case, uh, I think faith was more strong, stronger. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So my grandmother was born in 1929, so she's been talking to us about everything that went on and watching it from the U.S. And my question for you is, how do you feel with the times in the U.S that your children, grandchildren are living through right now. How do you feel about the times your children are living through current and grandchildren? Children and grandchildren today? are living the, through currently. Yeah, what's your, what's your sort of sense of the world that your, your children and grandchildren are living in today? Is that, is that a fair? Well, obviously, it's a completely different time. Uh, I always put myself into this boy's, uh, when he was eight years old, that's you, Adi. So I said to myself, can he do what I have done in those days? Today, with all the gadgets and all the, what I call the machines, uh, it's not, you know, people are not uh, really instrumental to be able to, to do the type of things that, that we did at that time. So they have a better life than I did. And I hope they continue that way. And also, I'm from Pittsburgh, and I want to know, how do you feel about the recent synagogue shootings? How do you, well, yeah, we feel, obviously, we feel very bad. We yeah. see, like the gentleman that asked before, could another Holocaust happen? Uh, we need to speak out. We, need, we can't afford, we cannot allow hatred to, to, to be part of our life on a daily life. We must speak out. And unfortunately, not only there, we saw it in California, we saw it in Charlottesville. So things like that. And as long as we read the signs, we must, we must speak out. And not only for myself, but every one of us right. have to speak out. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Um, I wanted to ask you a question a while ago, and, and very different than the ones that, oh, we have another question here. Yeah. I'm going to jump, I'm going to drop my question and go okay. to you. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, one thing that I'd like to ask you is, you, you have actually had first-hand experience with humanity at its worst. With, with, with what, I'm sorry? Humanity. Yeah, with you've humanity seen humanity at its worst. Yeah. But then you've also seen humanity sometimes at its best. So my question is for you is, we have a lot of young people here. What would be a message that you would have for our young people regarding kindness and humanity moving forward? Okay, your message, which you might be talking about towards the end anyways, but your message, particularly towards young people about uh, kindness and humanity and, and the importance of it. Am I getting that correct? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, well, obviously, it's very important to us to make sure that, that violence does not happen, uh, anti-Semitism should not be allowed, but we, we need to do our, our part. And I think a lot of people in the museum are doing that, and also a lot of people outside the museum are doing that. And that's what we try to educate young people in the universities, high schools, where we speak to them, where most of our, us Holocaust survivors do speak to these individuals and try to make them aware of that. And sometimes, you know, if you, if you can reach uh, six young people out of a crowd of 800, then at least you know you've done something. And these maybe six or eight will tell their friends, and their friends will tell their friends. So that's, it's mushrooming in the good way. And, and I like, Nat, that one of the things that you do in particular is you, you speak to a lot of the law enforcement groups that come in here and, 
you know, who are young recruits and young, uh, and, and, and teach them a lot about not only what you went through, but what the implications of that are. Yeah, very important. important work. Yeah, very important. Okay, thank you. Okay. Hi, Ned, thanks so much for your um, presentation. I was just wondering if you've ever thought about what you would say to the priest who um, uh -huh. turned in your family. <laughs> question is, have you thought about what you would, would like to, would you like to say to that priest if you had that opportunity to do it? I would like to ask him why he did that. Right. Obviously, we know he did it for monetary reasons. The only thing I am sorry, personally, that I was never, never able to thank this Dominic Grigori for all the things that he did mm -hmm. for me. Because after a while, we got to be friendly. And every time I finished my shift, per se, he always used to give me something, whatever he had left over from lunch or breakfast, either it was a chunk of cheese, he always used to tell me, Nat, take that to your sick little sister. Wow. And he knew exactly that that little thing that whatever he gave me will be shared for the rest of the family. But nonetheless, we kind of became friendly, and I'm sorry that I never got a chance to really thank mm -hmm. him. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. so thank that, you that's for one that. Of my okay, one thanks. last question, and then we're gonna close the program. Hi, um, I just wanted to ask if there's anything that we can do to help honor and respect the people who were unfortunately killed by the Nazis and anything that we can do in the future to ensure this doesn't happen again. What, the question is, what can we do to prevent uh, in the future what happened uh, to not Jews uh, through the Holocaust and what the Nazis did? Education, we have to educate. The more education that we have, the more we realize how important it is. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to turn back to Nat in just a moment to close our program. So we ask that you stay with us for just a, a couple moments more. I want to thank all of you for being here. Remind you that we'll have first person programs each Wednesday and Thursday until the 8th of August. All of our programs until June 6th will be live streamed. And all of our programs um, are available on our YouTube channel. Um, and from previous years as well. So if you can't come back this year, there are many other opportunities to, to take in one of the first person um, accounts of what happened during the Holocaust. So thank you for being with us. It's our tradition at first person that our first person gets the last word. And with that, I'm gonna turn to Nat to close our program. But just one other thing before I do, we invite anybody uh, in the audience, any of you who would like to come up when Nat's done, come up here on the stage, take the stairs, come up on the stage and meet Nat, shake his hand, and get your picture taken with him. That's okay with you, right, sure. Nat? So yep. we, we welcome that, so please know that. So Nat? It's very important that we speak out, as I mentioned earlier. Many individuals, many nations kept quiet during that period of time of the atrocities that happened in, in, by the Nazis during the Holocaust years. It's our duty and responsibility to humanity to make sure Holocaust like this never happen again. And I want to mention one thing that uh, the UN ambassador said, uh, Nikki Haley, and she said, and I quote, it's very important that we take sides. We cannot remain neutral. If you remain neutral and don't take sides, only benefits the perpetrator, not the, not, the, not the individual. So it's very important to all of us here that one day you realize that maybe one time in uh, May 15, 1919, I heard the individual speak about the Holocaust. And remember that because it's very important to us that especially the young people here know what happened and they continue to educate other individuals. Um, the things that actually is important to me is that one thing that we have against us is time. Most of us are in their 90s. I'm going to be 83 years old, and I'm one of the younger survivors. So I don't know how much longer we have to be here, but eventually there will be no survivors. And in that case, I'm counting on you guys to be our ambassador, our voices for the future. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>